visible, decisive, wrathful, unstoppable, bloody, gruesome, global. These are just some of the words that we might use to describe the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. If you thought the return of Jesus was going to be a big hug for the world, think again. If you thought Jesus was going to say, oh world, how I missed you, reconsider. In his first coming, he did not come to judge the world. He came to save the world. In his second coming, he will not come to save the world. He comes to judge the world. It will be opposite in every way. Everything you think about and know about the first coming, which we celebrate, of course, with Christmas, the second coming is the polar opposite. And this return of Christ, the second coming of Jesus, is the major theme of the book of Revelation. It is a theme and it is an event that has been anticipated in this apocalyptic writing since chapter 1. In fact, chapter 1, verse 7 reads this way, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, so it is to be. Amen. That was verse 7 of the first chapter. You'll remember we came to chapter 5 in that great scene of heaven where there is this scroll in the hand of the one who sits upon the throne and there is no one who can open this scroll and John is weeping and, and the angel says, Do not weep, for there is one who can open it. He is the lion from the tribe of Judah. He is the lamb who has been slain. And the Lord Jesus there in chapter 5 comes to the throne of God and takes that scroll and begins to break those seals and unleash the wrath of God in preparation for the second coming. We read this in chapter 11. Anticipating the reign of Christ, and the return of Christ. Then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. In chapter 14, we find a description of a great harvest to come. And one is told to drop his sickle into the earth and to harvest these grapes that are ripe. And then to throw those grapes into the great wine press of God's wrath. In chapter 16, we read of a gathering army of rebels against God. A great assembly of over 200 million for what is called the great day of God, the Almighty. Chapter 19, we read the words, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, has begun to reign in anticipation of Christ's return. And so it has been the theme of the book of Revelation. It has been anticipated all the way through the book of Revelation. But this is certainly not new or different from the rest of the Bible. Some have said there's nothing new in the New Testament. And there's a great amount of truth to this. Because the Old Testament prophets spoke extensively of this return of Christ. So much so that the Jews of Jesus' day were very confused when he arrived and was not taking over the country as king of kings. The Old Testament prophets had written so unceasingly about this event. Of course, Jesus himself, the Son of God, the Son of Man, was a prophet as well. And he taught extensively in a long line of prophets on this event, summing it up with these words of Matthew 24, 30. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. That's my title this morning, with power and great glory. This event is referred to over 300 times in the New Testament. Every single author of the New Testament speaks of it and almost every single book of the New Testament with the exception of one or two. Now you need to understand that this event we speak of this morning, the return of Christ all the way to the earth, the second coming of Christ is distinct from the rapture. 
You may think of one big second coming with phase A, the rapture, and phase B, the second coming or the return of Christ. But it is a, a distinct event from the snatching away of the bride of Christ, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the rapture then that will begin the seven-year tribulation period. It is the second coming that ends it, that puts the period on it. In fact, it is a major transition event in world history. On the one hand, the second coming of Christ will climax and complete the seven-year tribulation period, that seven-year time of God's wrath. On the other hand, it ushers into the world and upon the world the 1,000-year reign of Christ. Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, the great high priest on his throne in the temple of Jerusalem, reigning there in a perfect kingdom for a thousand years before the eternal kingdom. And so this will be a major transition event. It's also a necessary event. It must happen. It will happen because it has to happen. You see, without the return of Christ, the whole point of creation and redemption falls to the wayside. It's just that important. <laughs> Without the return of Christ, then endless warnings and threats of God just become empty and vain, and many, many promises of God fail. And of course, this cannot happen. The return of Christ then should be studied, it should be prayed for, and it should be thought about by every Christian on a regular basis. This is a major doctrine of our faith. This is not secondary. This is not on the periphery of Christianity. This is at the very heart and soul of the revelation of God from cover to cover. And you will do yourself well to consider it on a daily basis, to pray for it on a daily basis. And certainly for those future tribulation saints, those who miss the rapture, because perhaps they procrastinated in coming to Christ and find themselves here on earth during the tribulation and then they come to Christ, well, this event won't come soon enough for them. Of course, mil many millions of them will be martyred. Some will survive and some will be begging the Lord to come to their rescue. Revelation 19, 11 to 21 then is is a great passage on the second coming, but far from the only. There are many passages in the Bible that speak of this event. And kind of like the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all have their own purpose, right? Each Gospel has its own emphasis. So each passage on the second coming has its own unique purpose and its own unique emphasis. And what we want to do today is unpack the purpose and emphasis of this passage. We could spend, of course, hours and, and days and weeks looking throughout the scriptures at all of the others, but we're going to stay here today because there is more than enough for our attention. From a literary standpoint, for the writer John, everything in this book has led up to this passage. This is the literary climax of the book of Revelation. It's the mountaintop of the book, and everything that remains will flow from this passage. And so we've come then to the pinnacle of the book. And I would say by design also then the pinnacle of human history in the sense of the glory of Christ on display. There are many details you could see and hear as I read it, many details, but there is one common denominator. One common denominator opens this passage up for us and brings to us the main point of this passage, and here it is. The return of Christ is about Christ. He is the one common denominator of this passage. It is all connected to Him, rooted in Him, points to Him, and glorify and honors Him. So here's, here's the big idea this morning. Here's the main argument of this sermon. The second coming of Christ will bring more attention to Jesus than any event in history. The second coming of Christ, this event, will bring more attention to Jesus, more outward honor, more evident glory than any event in history. And just think about that for a moment. 
you think about his conception, of course, which was mysterious and invisible and unknown only to, to just Mary, known only to Mary. And, and you think about his birth in that obscure cave in obscure Bethlehem and very few people knew about it. His life as he grew up in Nazareth. Who, what good comes out of Nazareth, right? This obscure hick, hick town in northern Israel. His cross, yeah, several people saw him die, but it was a tiny fraction of humanity. His resurrection, no one was a witness to. His ascension, just a handful of his followers on a, on a mountainside across the Kidron Valley. The rapture will be basically invisible to the world. Millions will see him face to face, the church, but still a tiny fraction of humanity. But not this event. This will be a worldwide event, a global event. Every eye will see him. There will be more attention and more vindication and more recognition of the Lord Jesus Christ in this event than any other event in history. That's the argument. Now let me give you 14 proofs <laughs> from the text. They come at us in rapid fire, staccato fashion. 14 proofs that the return of Christ is about Christ. Number one, his origin, heaven. John says, and I saw heaven opened. In the Greek, it's the heaven opened to where it will stay opened. <laughs> it's perfect tense verb, opened with continuing results. This tells us of the origin of Christ. Where does he come from in the second coming? From whence does he come? He comes from heaven. He comes from God's right hand. He comes from the throne of God, the throne of the universe, in a place of perfect glory and power, bliss. He has come to earth once and returned to heaven, and now he comes from heaven to return to earth. The origin of his return is God's very dwelling place. It's not just a place, it's a place where God rules. It's a place where the will of God is done perfectly and instantly and always. And so the return of Christ, because he comes from heaven, we are reminded that he comes as God's emissary. He comes as a sent one. This has the Father's approval. It, it comes on the Father's command. He comes from heaven. That's his origin. He doesn't come from earth. He doesn't come from hell. He doesn't come from under the earth. He comes from glorious, perfect heaven to bring about the will of God on earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven. Because that's his origin. I saw heaven opened. Number two, second proof, his ride. His mode of transportation. It is a white horse, a white steed, uh, an energetic, powerful war horse. White horses are fairly rare. I don't know that I've seen very many myself. Maybe that horse on the Lone Ranger back in the day. <laughs> I just read recently that George Washington rode a white horse. It got shot out from under him one battle. He quickly transferred to a chestnut horse because it wasn't this white horse. And this isn't George Washington. A white steed. He comes on a white horse. Well, this is interesting because a white horse is what the generals would ride after they won the battle. And they rode back into the city with their vanquished foes behind them to a celebration parade. This is what the Roman generals would do as they came back into Rome. They then rode a white horse. He rides a white horse before the battle. Telling us what? I'm going to win. <laughs> this white horse anticipates the victory that is to come. Second proof that the return of Christ is about Christ is he comes on a white horse, a horse of victory, a horse of power. There is no doubt of the outcome. Third proof, his character. He who sat on the white horse is called faithful and true. Faithful and true, trustworthy and true. He cannot fail, he cannot lie. He cannot let you down. He will never disappoint. 
He will never fail to keep even one of his promises, no matter how small or obscure they may seem to be. He is, by definition, faithful and true. That's his essence. That's his character. That's who he is. And of course, this is in contrast to Antichrist, who has been on the scene, having his day in the sun, having his little fun, carrying out his schemes, but he was anything but faithful and true. He was unfaithful and he was deceptive. He was a liar through and through. He was a tool of Satan. But now the tool of God comes who always tells us the truth and who always carries out the truth. The one who is trustworthy. The world can't be trusted. Man can't be trusted. The arm of the flesh will fail you, but not the arm of faithful and true. This is his name, and his name is his person. It's who he is. It's his character. He is the one that rides the white horse to victory. I remind you to think of him and aim your life toward him and trust in him today. Don't put your trust in man. Don't put your trust in government. Don't put your trust in doctors. Don't put your trust in medicines. Trust faithful and true. Trust his word. Hear from him who will never lie to you, will never leave you, will never forsake you. That's his character. Number four, his activity. His activity is there in verse 11. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. Faithful and true comes as the judge of all men, the final bar of justice, the final Supreme Court, where there is no higher court of appeal. He comes as the judge of mankind because he is a man, 100% man, 100% God. And so he is the one qualified to judge you and me and the rest of the world. There will be no excuses before the one who lived here. There'll be no excuses before the one who walked here, who faced every temptation that we faced, yet without sin, and who did so in the power of the Holy Spirit, as a man, as the better Adam, as we've sung. There'll be no arguments that can rise up against him. He will judge the world in righteousness, perfect equity, perfect fairness. Is all that this court will dispense. It's all this court can dispense because he's faithful and true. And it says he wages war, and that's sort of, yeah, I mean, yeah, he wages war, but it's really more like he wages executions. It's not like a war like we think about war. It's not a battle, it's not a fight, as we'll see. This is the essence then of his activity when he comes. In this second coming, he comes to judge and to execute. Number five, his disposition. The, the fifth proof that the return of Christ is all about Christ is his disposition. You see it in verse 12. His eyes are a flame of fire. Commentators have different viewpoints on this. Some think of this as being all-knowing, all-seeing, you know, penetrating. And, and I think sometimes we, we might read back 2,100 years what we think of in our day and age, like laser or, or penetrating light. That's not what I think about when I think about somebody's eyes burning. I think about anger. I think his fundamental disposition at the return of Christ is one of burning anger. Burning anger for the glory of God, for the cause of Christ. Burning anger for the fact that Antichrist and his minions have killed and tortured untold thousands of Christ's people, his, his redeemed. So he comes with eyes that are flames of fire, eyes like fire. And this is not even new in the book of Revelation. This was how he was described back in chapter 1. When John had that great vision of the risen Christ, he says his eyes are a flame of fire. So he's not to be trifled with. Certainly he's all-knowing. Certainly his, his glare penetrates to the heart. Certainly he knows all of the sins of all of the billions of people who will be dwelling on the planet. Those eyes burn with holiness. They burn with purity. They burn with perfection. They burn with a settled wrath against anything that is contrary to the holiness of God himself. And this is a fire that, would, that will purify, that will punish, that will 
accomplish all of God's purposes. That's his disposition. Number six, his authority. Look at that in verse 12. On his head, again, all of this, a lot of this in contrast to Antichrist, on his head are many diadems. Diadems, the word for a royal crown. So they're just stacked up. I think this is figurative. I think it's representative that he has all authority, right? What, what did he say in the Great Commission? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. We might think of it this way. He's got all of the authority of the continent of Africa and the continent of Asia and the Americas and Europe. All authority belongs to him. He has all authority in heaven, the universe, all authority on earth. Perhaps there will be some 200 some odd nations in existence when he returns to earth. He'll have a crown for every nation because he is Lord of lords and King of kings and he has on his head much authority. Authority to act, authority to represent God, authority to carry out the threats of God that he has been giving the world for millennia. Every nation is under his rule. Every kingdom of man is under his rule. Every human being is under his rule. Every animal is under his rule. Every bird of the sky is under his rule. He has many diadems upon his head. When he comes, his first coming, he came as a baby in a manger. Only a, a handful of people knew this was the king. As he hung on the cross, he wore a crown of thorns hammered into his precious head. But when he comes, many diadems will announce to the world, I am the Lord God Almighty in human flesh. All authority will belong to our Lord Jesus. And it will be visible and tangible and known. Number seven, seventh proof is his deity. This was the most challenging one of all to label. And I just finally settled on his deity. I'm looking now at the rest of verse 12. It says, he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. Now, this is a little confusing because several names are given to him in this passage. Faithful and true. Word of God we'll see later. King of kings we'll see later. But here is a name that is not named in the passage. Here is a name that is unknown. In fact, it says no one knows except himself. It's mysterious, obviously. It's incomprehensible. I think this is a way of John saying he comes as fully God. I think this speaks to his deity. This is God in flesh. Because ultimately, though he is fully man and he can sympathize with us and, and we can empathize and sympathize with him as a fellow human being, ultimately he is incomprehensible, <clears throat> ineffable, indescribable. Name speaks of character. Name speaks of your essence. This Christ has a name which no one knows except himself. In other words, no one knows except God because only God can know the depths of God. It's only the Spirit of God who can know the mind of God perfectly well. And so here he comes in full deity. Number eight, his clothing. Verse 13, he is clothed, he is wrapped, he is robed with a robe dipped in blood. That's the word for baptized. Immersed in blood. And his, oh, we'll stop there. <laughs> he comes in, in a robe dipped in blood. What is the context? The context is war, right? The context is judging and executing. This is not the blood of the saints who had been martyred in the tribulation. This is not the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross for the sins of his own. This is the blood of those executed. This is the blood of his enemies splattered up and all over his robe. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 63. His clothing is John's way, figuratively speaking, of telling us he comes as a blood-covered warrior. A blood-covered warrior. 
Look at Isaiah 63. And we're going to look at verses 1 to 6. Who is this who comes from Edom with garments of glowing colors from Basra? This one who is majestic in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength? It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Of course, he comes to save Israel, his remnant, who will be surrounded by these rebel armies. Verse 2, the writer now is questioning this one who comes. Why is your apparel red? And your garments like the ones who treads, like the one who treads in the wine press. I, and here's the answer, I have trodden the wine trough alone. And from the peoples there was no man with me. I also trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. And their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments. And I stained all my raiment. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. I looked, and there was no one to help. And I was astonished, and there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought salvation to me, and my wrath upheld me. I trod down the peoples in my anger, and made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. So his clothing is that of a blood-covered warrior. I don't know if anyone in here, maybe there are some who have been in, in hand-to-hand -hand combat. But even in our day and age, a lot of warfare can, can be not as bloody. You know, we drop bombs from planes and, and we guide them from California on the other side of the world using drones and technology. And, and, and snipers even shoot people a mile away. Um, but not, not this context, not, not the context of the first century. Most warfare was hand-to-hand -hand combat. Most warfare was extremely bloody and gruesome. And so it is as he comes, clothed this way. Number nine, the ninth proof is his relation to God. His relation to God. Look at verse 13. His name is called the Word of God, the Logos of God, the message of God. Again, His name is His character, it's His essence, and so this speaks of His connection with God, His relation to God. We've already seen that He is God, that's deity. Now we're seeing that He's also related to God. It's much like John 1.1 1, 1 and John 1.14. In the beginning was the Word, Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So here is his relation to God. When he comes, he will be called the revelation of God. Here is the one who will reveal to the world all of the purposes of God, both in salvation of Israel and the remnant and damnation and judgment of the world. He does both. He reveals all of God's purposes. Think of it this way. He, he is both message and messenger. He is both revealer and revelation. The, the living word reveals the written word. He is the word. He is the message. And, and, and from cover to cover, that message is not just one of love, and it's not just one of grace, and it's not just the gospel. It is a message of judgment and reconciliation, right? of wrath and forgiveness. And all of this is found and embodied in Christ. He comes then as both judge and redeemer. Number 10, his army. His army, this is in verse 14. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Okay, so now we also have our horse. And it's also a white horse because we come in anticipation of victory. And we're following him, behind him. They came from heaven with him. If you go back up to verse 8, we begin to see that this army is none other than the church. The raptured church. Because in verse 8, well, back to verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad, give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. That's the church. 
Verse 8, it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. The armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean. It's all the same words. Exact same. The fine linens, the righteous acts of the saints. They're following him on white horses. This is the raptured church in our glorified bodies, riding white horses, returning with Christ. <laughs> We're on the right side of this thing, folks. Put, put that on your face every morning. <laughs> He's not going to be coming at me. I'm going to be coming behind him and with him. Part of his army. This is incredible. The bride becomes a battalion. The wife becomes a warrior. Let's go back to chapter 2. and We see another indication that this is none other than the church. This is one of those incredible promises we came across in the seven letters to the seven churches. It just seems over the top. We look at chapter 2, verse 26. This was to the church at Thyatira. He says in verse 26, he who overcomes. And we learned that that was a, just a way of describing a Christian. One who perseveres in the faith. He who overcomes and who keeps my deeds until the end. Look at this. To him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my father. And I will give him the morning star. And so things that are true about Christ are going to be true about us. And we're going to come with him. And we're going to have his authority. He's going to delegate that to us like the father delegated it to him. And we're going to share in his rule and reign and participate in some very mysterious way as his bride turned battalion. Now, this is a strange army. Very strange indeed, because although they're riding white horses, they have no weapons of warfare because they are immune to injury. They're immortal. And they're invincible. And nothing can harm them. So they have no weapons. It's also a strange army because they do not participate in the battle. They merely watch and celebrate and praise the commander-in-chief. They come with him. They come following him. And they celebrate his victory. Number 11, his weapon. Not only is it a strange army with no weapons and no participation, but it is a strange warrior in front of this army because this warrior only has one weapon. It's a sword. It can kind of serve as a spear as well. It's the big sword, the big, long, broad sword. But there's something odd about this warrior because the sword is not in his hand. The sword comes out of his mouth. That's not literal, that's figurative. That's symbolic. The Lord Jesus is in his glorified human body. This word, this sword that comes out of his mouth is his mere word. It is his authoritative word, all powerful. It's his one and only weapon. Are you with me? He's going to come as the king of kings, not with a nuclear arsenal, but with the mere speech of his mouth, and it will drop every one of his enemies. It's no hand-to-hand -hand combat. This is no battle. He has one weapon, and that's all he needs. That leads us to number 12, his mission from God. His mission from God. The word of God comes to carry out final world judgment. We see this in the three allusions that are made to the warrior Messiah. There in verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword. What's he going to do with it? Three things. And they all allude to passages in the Old Testament that speak of the warrior Messiah. Our God is a warrior. The first one is he will strike down the nations. This comes from Isaiah chapter 11, 1 to 3. The second one is he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. This comes from Psalm 2, verse 9. And the third is, he will tread out the grapes of the wrath of God. This comes from the passage we've already read, Isaiah 63, 1 to 6. 
So three intentional, deliberate allusions to Old Testament references to the warrior Messiah who comes not to take sides, but to take over. That's his mission from God then. Final and complete world judgment. That brings us to his exalted title, number 13. His exalted title there in verse 16. He has a robe because he's kingly. He has crowns of authority. And on his robe, over the area of his thighs, not written literally on his, the, the, the skin of his thighs, but over the thigh area. In other words, in a most prominent area that can be seen easily by all, there on his robe are these two titles. These are not names. These are titles. King of kings and Lord of lords. Singular, one and only, ruler of rulers, master of masters, potentate of all potentates. It tells us that even as we move into the millennial kingdom and even as we move into the eternal kingdom, there might still be kings, little k, and lords, little lords, but they will all have one recognized king and ruler. And there will be no arguing that issue. This title will be for all to see. Now, now, now just think about this in the history of the world and the moment that this is going to bring to the world. King of kings, Lord of lords. There will not be any debates on this. There will be no discussion, no disagreements, no arguments. There will be no discussing it, no voting on it. No pondering it, no considering it, no reflecting on it. There will be no denying it. No one, no one will deny this. It just is. In fact, as you look at the passage, this is the centerpiece of the passage. This is the, the apex of the passage. This is Philippians 2, folks. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's going to happen. Those in the heaven, those on the earth, those under the earth. No doubting it, no debating it, no discussing it, no denying it. King of kings, Lord of lords. Perfect vindication for our Lord Jesus. He has been mocked. He has been ridiculed. He has been ignored. He has been disbelieved for centuries. No longer. <laughs> the whole world will come trembling before him and either rage against him in unrepentant sin or beg him for forgiveness and mercy. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. And that brings us to the 14th proof, his, his victory. This is 17 to 21. His victory. It's complete, it's decisive, it's total. His victory is so certain, not only was he on a white horse to begin with, but his victory is so certain that an angel here makes an announcement to assemble the birds, the carrion birds, before the destruction of his enemies. This is the only command in this passage. It is the word assemble in verse 17. Come, assemble for the great supper of God. Folks, this is all literal. John makes it a point to tell us flesh, 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 flesh. How many times does he have to say it? He means human flesh and flesh and flesh of horses. The angel gives the command. Of course, the angel was told by Christ, who was told by God, to give the command to gather these birds for this total victory. The beast, Antichrist, little horn, and false prophet, they're thrown alive into a cauldron of fire instantly. The beast was seized, the false prophet, instantly. Now consider that, because they have deluded the world with their signs and wonders. They have tapped into satanic powers, and those powers are a big zero when it comes to avoiding this capture and execution. They can do nothing about this. They cannot fight back in the least. It just, it's so anticlimactic. They're seized and they're thrown 
just like that. All of their demonic powers gives them nothing to escape. No help whatsoever. They can't put a scratch on Jesus. These who have destroyed untold millions of his followers can't touch him. Seized. Who was seized? Well, this prophet who performed signs, miracles, wonders in the presence of Antichrist, deceived the world who worshiped Antichrist. They're thrown alive, screaming in agony into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone, burns with sulfur. They don't even get executed first. They get thrown to their eternal grave while still living. And the rest are instantly killed by his mere word. Killed with a sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. He just spoke it. And it happened. It will happen. And then his cleanup crew goes to work. That's what it is. A cleanup crew of millions upon millions of vultures, buzzards, crows, ravens, every carrion bird that flies in mid-heaven is called to assemble and be gathered in Israel for this feast of human flesh. And all of this is just as Jesus himself had predicted. Jesus said while he was here the first time, for just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be wherever the corpse is there the vultures will gather. His victory here cannot be faster. It cannot be more complete. It cannot be more decisive. It cannot be more overwhelming. You know, if you were looking for a good battle, Armageddon's going to be a huge letdown. <laughs> it's, it's not a battle. In chapter 13 of verse 4 of the book of Revelation, the question is asked, Who is like the beast and who is able to wage war with him? Here's our answer. It's like going to a hyped up boxing fight of the century, right? And the knockout punch is given one second into the first round. So from origin of heaven to the outcome of complete and total and decisive victory, the second coming of Jesus is all about Jesus. It's about his glory. It's about his power on display for all to see. Every one of these threads ties back into him who is to come. So by way of application, let me speak to you believers here for a moment. You who follow Christ, you who will be raptured with the church, and you know it. Amen? You know it, and you're going to be raptured, and that can happen any moment. Nothing else needs to happen prophetically for the trumpet to sound. You who will follow him on white horses, clothed in fine linen, the righteous deeds of the saints. Let me speak to you for a moment by way of application. If the greatest event in human history, the most visible at least, the most uh, evidently glorifying to Christ is the second coming, what can we learn about that now? I think it's simply this. How prominent is Jesus in your life now? How is he being glorified in your life now? Is he on your lips? Is he on your mind? Do you commune with him daily? Do you try to lead others to him? Do you love him? Do you serve him? Do you walk with him and worship him? Is Jesus prominent and preeminent and in first place in your life now? What's squeezing him out? What's getting first place and he's getting second place? Or what's... Getting, he's in second place and or, or he's getting crumbs, you know. The whole book of Revelation is pointing us to Christ, but is your life pointing other people to Christ? And I just want to share with you, the only way this is going to happen is an extended time with him. And let me tell you, that needs to be every day and it needs to be in the morning. You need to spend time with Jesus in the morning every day. And I need to do this. And if we don't do this, the world is not going to see Christ in us. And they're not going to see his preeminence and his glory and his greatness. They're going to see a whole lot of us and a little bit of him. But if we will carve out and dedicate 
a substantial, meaningful part of our morning to Him before our day starts. In fact, many Christians of old have said, before you see the face of another person, you need to see the face of Christ. Before you speak to another person, you need to speak with God. I know I can do a lot of damage in just a few short sentences <laughs> in the morning, right? Some of you say, before I have my coffee, you know, before I speak to another person, I've got to have my coffee. Well, yes, and before you have your coffee, speak to Christ. <laughs> and as you have your coffee, speak to Christ. We've got to start our day with Him if people are going to see Him shining brightly through us. Now to the unsaved, to the unbeliever, to those who don't know it, you can't say amen, you can't know that you're going to be raptured when this event happens. Here is what God says to you this morning. This comes from the Bible. This comes from God. This is what he has to say. This is really all you need to hear this morning is these words. God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. That means change your mind. Turn around. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. That's Acts 17, 30 to 31 that came from the mouth of the Apostle Paul as he preached to unbelievers. Let me read this verse again from the New Living Translation. Let me simplify it for you because this is all you need to hear this morning if you're an unbeliever. God commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to Him. For He has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man He has appointed. And He proved to everyone who this is by raising Him from the dead. What this means is you need to change your old way of thinking about who God is and about yourself and about your sin. And you need to show remorse for your sins, regret for your sins. You need to renounce them and hate them and feel sorry for them before a holy God. Because those sins have been against God and against His love and against His goodness. And you need to show remorse to God for those sins. That remorse does not save you, but that remorse is the evidence that you understand that you have offended a holy God. And then thirdly, you need to seek God's will for your life which is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. <laughs> you need to seek God's will in His Word. Commit yourself to be a disciple of Christ by the grace of God, with the strength God gives. Lord, from this day forward, I'm going to begin to follow Christ. From this day forward, I want to renounce my sin and put my back to my sin and begin to walk in a new direction with a new way of living. My life has got to change, Lord. I've made a wreck of it. I've, I've messed it up bad. You've given me so many good blessings, and I've spurned them, and I haven't been thankful. I've been a complainer. I've been an idolater. I've been a pagan. I've loved myself. I've loved my sin. God, I'm sorry. God, I ask you in the name of Jesus to forgive me. God, will you take me now for the rest of my life and lead me and guide me and, and be my God, and, and I want to commit my life to your will. Listen, you're out of excuses. You never really had any to begin with, but you're out if you thought you did. <laughs> and you may run out of time. Procrastinate further, and you may just run out of time. You may be those people left behind, those people who mock the rapture and then find out, where did all the Christians go? Why are all the real churches empty? What happened to these cemeteries? And then you're going to be on the receiving end of seven years of hell on earth. This is no fable. There's no myth. There's no story for women and children. See, it's like this. There are two kinds of invitations in life. The first kind is joyful and exciting. It's like an invitation to a wedding of someone you love. It would be like an invitation to an all-expense-paid trip to the place you've always wanted to go in your life, right? Maybe you're a sports nut. You get an invitation that comes with tickets to the Final Four in San Antonio for men's basketball or maybe the Super Bowl or the National Championship or maybe it's some great trip to Israel and you get, you get in the mail, here's an invitation for you to come join your favorite Bible teacher to go to Israel, whatever it might be. That's one kind of invitation. And you're excited when you're opening it, and you're glad, and you're joyful. There's another kind of invitation in life, and it's dreaded, and it's feared. It would be like a summons to a court date for that ticket you forgot to pay. And the summons is that reminder, oh, 
or maybe even worse, you get in the mail, you have been selected for an IRS audit. <laughs> and fear and trembling. <laughs> or maybe worse than that, you've been indicted by a grand jury and there has been a warrant put out for your arrest and you've been invited and summoned to appear in court. Today you are, you are receiving the first kind of this invitation, the one that is joyful and exciting. But if you ignore it and if you toss it in the trash can, you will receive the second in due course. If you will answer the first invitation, you will ride with Jesus and you will feast at the Messianic banquet. But if you wait for the second invitation, you are the banquet. You can eat or be eaten. The question that you should have if you're outside of Christ this morning is how do I avoid the vultures? How do I not face the buzzards and the crows and the ravens picking my corpse apart? You must answer the call of Christ. You must respond to his invitation this morning. You need to RSVP. I will be there. I accept. I receive. I admit. I confess. I want to be on the right side of Jesus when he comes. You've seen these invitations where you can say, I can't come with regrets. Oh. If you check the with regrets box, you're going to have an eternity of regrets. Let's pray. God, I pray this morning that someone here, maybe a child, maybe a teenager, maybe an older adult, maybe a senior that doesn't have many days left, I pray, God, that someone here this morning would check the box RSVP. I receive. I'm coming. I want in. God, may it be by the power of your word and the power of your spirit. I know that I can't do this. And Billy Graham couldn't do it. No man on earth can convert the human heart and soul. But by the message preached of the good news of Jesus, you can bring new life. And it's our collective prayer this morning in his name that you would do so. You bring revival to this church. And you'd begin to save today the unsaved in our midst because we know they're here. And we know you know they're here. <laughs> and so we, we, we just beg you, Lord, to look on them now with favor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing our closing song uh, now. Uh, for us to rejoice in the Lord in his, in his reign, his coming reign. If I haven't met you, if you're new with us, and maybe